Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a treat to be here. And it's also a treat to follow Dr. Norton because you know you can't compete. She is the best teacher that I've ever known. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we honor her every day and we miss her a lot. <clears throat> um, I work at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, this is our new name as of a week ago, uh, as we uh, just learned again that we <clears throat> were given a grant by the Osher family, which we appreciate very much. <clears throat> this, uh, this is our symbol for integrative medicine, um, and we take it very seriously. We are very committed to uh, healing the whole person, mind, body, and spirit, and we do our best to uh, care for people with compassion. <clears throat> Get my gadgets. Um, <clears throat> And uh, w this will unfold with uh, the talk we give. <clears throat> Could you speak up just a little bit? I can. Uh, can you turn me up a little bit? <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, why chronic pain management from an integrated medicine center? <clears throat> because... Pain uh, afflicts a person as a whole. And we strongly believe that in order to appropriately treat pain, we need to be treated as a whole. So <clears throat> that's the essence of it. That's what we're going to unfold with you today. <clears throat> uh, I have been in working on pain for a number of years, both in the field of palliative care and hospice, and now integrative medicine. <clears throat> um, this, these are some staggering numbers. <clears throat> this is the opioid prescription rate by county in 2007. Um, <clears throat> the pres prescriptions per 100 population uh, at uh, 141 prescriptions are in the red, and then you see they go down to 105. <clears throat> so that's staggering, isn't it? 2007. Look at 2011. <clears throat> yep. So, <clears throat> uh, opioids, uh, narcotics, uh, pain pills are being overused and, and abused. They're <clears throat> sold uh, uh, by physicians and prescribed by physicians. That's the only way you can get these opioids. Uh, so, our uh, we have to have a new approach to managing pain. Here's the related overdose um, death, death in Tennessee uh, at currently. Um, and you can see the, the incredible growth of this. And this is staggering to see that this exceeds the death due to motor vehicle um, accidents homicide or suicide. <clears throat> so uh, the abuse of um, opioids is a serious problem and it's a serious problem for those people who have chronic pain because they get lumped into the category of people who have drug addiction uh, from physician prescriptions and <clears throat> it, it makes their care more tr troubling. So I want to tell you a story about John John uh, was a patient that came to see us um, a few years ago. He had um, a history of having had <clears throat> a serious automobile accident and then surgery on his neck uh, nine years before that. And he had been on opioids or narcotics uh, since his injury. He came to see us and <clears throat> wanted to know what we could do for him. And we suggested the possibility that getting off of his opioids was uh, a thing to consider. He told us that in those nine years, no one had ever offered him that possibility. It turns out that <clears throat> opioids, uh, narcotics, are frequently uh, related to increase in pain in people who have um, <clears throat> chronic pain. So 
we are regularly asking people if they would like to consider getting off of their long-term uh, opioids. <clears throat> so John uh, did get off of opioids. He uh, <clears throat> came back and wrote us a letter um, that he dropped off <clears throat> about uh, what we had done. Again, he pointed to the fact that <clears throat> um, he pointed to the fact that we had offered him the possibility of getting off of opioids, but he he made a very very concerning um, remark in this um, letter. He said that we were some of the few clinicians that did not ridicule him. Ridicule is the word he used. Ridicule. That really shook me to see that someone had been <clears throat> seeing physicians and clinicians for these nine years, and he was uh, naming that ridicule is part of what he has endured. A lot of this comes out of the uh, staggering numbers that we saw for abuse of opioids in this state. <clears throat> he also said, you saved my life. This was not just me, this was our entire center had been caring for him. And he said, you have saved my life. So that's what we as clinicians live for, to hear that from our patients. And <clears throat> um, uh, John, oh, <clears throat> that, keep going. <laughs> we, we can dance. <clears throat> uh, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it, was, it was really, um, it's very special to get this letter, and it's not uncommon for us to hear things like this from patients every day, because we see, <clears throat> we'll see 12,000 visits this year, and 80% of those visits are for pain. <clears throat> so John uh, and his story is one that sticks with me as I go through my daily work um, every day. <clears throat> And what we really focus on at the Vanderbilt Center for Integrative Health is compassion. <clears throat> this is Henry Nouwen's definition, which is one of my favorites. <clears throat> the um, compassion is derived from to suffer with. Compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. And what we know and has been proven time and time again that the way the clinician approaches the patient with chronic pain or any kind of pain has a lot to do with how well the patient does. There's a huge <clears throat> effect of uh, a, a physician or a clinician treating a patient with compassion. <clears throat> um, here's the first principle of the Code of Medical Ethics for the American uh, medical Association, a physician shall be dedicated to providing competent medical care with compassion and respect for human dignity and rights. More in depth, this is from uh, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, who has been one of the principal bioethicists in the world of medicine for the last 50 years. This is what he writes, the capacity to recognize, analyze, and resolve ethical issues at the bedside is just as important as the knowledge of basic and clinical sciences. This judgment follows inescap inescapably if you accept the idea that the end of medicine is a right and good healing action of the particular human being. This capacity is at least one of the more tangible elements of compassion. A reconstruction of the professional ethics on a new appreciation of what makes for a true healing relationship, a relationship between the clinician and the patient um, <clears throat> is both possible and necessary. And just to finish with this line of thinking and, um, and, think, and uh, really useful words from some of the leaders in our profession. This is by Harvey Feinberg, who is the president of the Institute of Medicine. Can you develop compassion in the same sense that you acquire other knowledge and skills that make up the craft of medicine? 
the conscientious physician can learn compassion. It can be done. And it needs to be something that we focus on in our uh, profession. <clears throat> so today's ob objectives then, after that intro, is for all of us to take a radical shift in our understanding of chronic pain. <clears throat> um, I've been teaching this to first year medical residents, so these are first year doctors <clears throat> uh, for several years now, and <clears throat> um, most of them learn a lot when they uh, hear these things addressed. So what we'll be doing is uh, uh, understanding the presence, the importance of the cerebral cortex, the <clears throat> executive function part of the brain, up in the front part of the brain, that <clears throat> has a lot to do with decision making. Um, <clears throat> we will begin to understand central sensitization and hypersensitization. <clears throat> Anybody in this room know what that means? <clears throat> so uh, out of 40 first year medical residents last year, there was one. There was one that knew. <clears throat> so uh, you're not in the dark. 5% uh, of every patient that uh, is in the Vanderbilt Medical Center, or any medical center for that matter, is likely to have this. So <clears throat> I'm glad that uh, I'll be able to plant one small seed in your brains today. <clears throat> the brain is very plastic, and I'm sure you've heard that from Dr. Norton repeatedly, <clears throat> and can change. And the, and the uh, by using the, the executive function of the prefrontal cortex of the brain. <clears throat> so uh, it can, the pre cortex can receive an, an impulse and can change it. <clears throat> Treating emotions through body-centered therapies desensitizes. It's already been suggested that we do mind-body medicine, and that is true. And the connection between the mind and the body has to be a part of any treatment of chronic pain. <clears throat> Emotions are very important, and they need to be managed in order to help desensitize um, the patient's <clears throat> pain. The relationship between the clinician and, the clinician and the patient with chronic pain really matters, as I've already emphasized. And the good news is there's a lot <clears throat> on the horizon to really help. <clears throat> Anybody recognize this? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so uh, it's Michelangelo, right? <clears throat> In Sistine Chapel. What do you see here? <clears throat> touching. Touching. So tr an attempt to touch. Actually, the fingers don't touch, but <clears throat> um, this is 1525. <clears throat> what do you see here? Yes, very good. It's almost, and not, it's very rare for anybody to connect, catch the homunculus here. So in 1525, um, in 1525, Michelangelo understood the brain had a lot to do with human suffering and pain. <clears throat> I have to throw that out every time, it's wonderful. <clears throat> so what is chronic pain? Chronic pain is pain that lasts longer than three months or six to six months, three to six months, and it's longer than uh, you would expect healing to uh, continue. So <clears throat> uh, chronic pain is not what you have when you just had a um, broken leg or surgery. Chronic pain is pain that persists beyond what you would expect it to, uh, to uh, do. And so uh, there are a lot of people who have chronic pain. <clears throat> so where does chronic pain come from? Well, it comes in all these body parts, you know, in legs and arms and backs that we think about. And we think that because there's an abnormality on a, an x-ray that that's the source of the pain. <clears throat> but the truth is that uh, most pain that we have is come in chronic, chronic, most chronic pain is uh, involved in the brain. So, <clears throat> th th thank you for that silence. That uh, 
that's very helpful because uh, we're going to go into how this all works. But just one last, <clears throat> one last piece of information. <clears throat> Look at this number. 600, I can't see it from being this close to it, but the cost of paying 300, $635 billion. Anybody know how much the entire Medicare program costs? <clears throat> the same. Okay? So this is a huge issue. These, these things that we've, you've already seen, the data you've already seen around this are striking. And we have a very limited way to give people appropriate uh, care for pain. <clears throat> So this, this is going to be the essence of what we talk about today. <clears throat> who, uh, anybody have a child or a friend who has a, had a leg or arm lost in um, the wars? So there have been a lot of uh, casualties and a lot of people have lost limbs <clears throat> in the last 15 years or so. Uh, anybody know anyone who has a phantom limb syndrome? It's remarkably common for the kids coming back from Afghanistan and the same for Iraq. <clears throat> so um, this man, Ramachandran, has done uh, a beautiful job of describing <clears throat> this, this uh, and, and helping us think about how to get it better. So we are not sure what the source of the pain is or wh what it, where it comes from, but we are sure that it comes from where? The brain, right. So if you have, in this, uh, it's, there's a missing hand, right? <clears throat> so uh, um, this missing hand is hurting like the Dickens. It's not, it's not this part that's hurting. Your fingers are hurting. Does it make any sense? No. It doesn't make any sense to the patient. It doesn't make any sense to the <clears throat> family. It doesn't make any sense to people on the street. And it especially doesn't make any sense to clinicians. That's, that's the unfortunate part of it. <clears throat> if, if, you, uh, if you don't know something, then you create something in your mind. And we'll get into more deep detail about that, but <clears throat> um, uh, these people have been abused forever because how can your pain be that real? Well, it's real. <clears throat> What's so exciting about this picture is not that <clears throat> uh, this hand is here, it's this, is, this hand is also here. This is, a, is the uh, <clears throat> The picture in, in, a, in a mirror. So <clears throat> we now treat phantom limb syndrome by uh, putting their arm, that they, if we stick with the arm, putting the arm in, if, if this arm is present, this arm is gone, we put a mirror on the right hand and it uh, projects onto the mirror here. And so what we do is sort of trick the brain to thinking that because um, <clears throat> the left arm is able to move, the, the arm is okay and I'm gonna let it get better. We don't understand the mechanism that's being stu studied uh, every day, but <clears throat> isn't that fascinating? That you can make the pain get better and it doesn't happen every time. <clears throat> but that, that is really, really important. And so all that we're going to be talking about here is going to spin around this phenomenon. When, you, when, you say, when I say something you can't believe, just remember that this arm is really hurting and there's something we can do about it. <clears throat> so this guy, C.J. Wolf, I believe he should win the Nobel Prize for his research. He's been doing research on central sensitization uh, for 25 years. <clears throat> Here's a quote for, for him, from him. 
Uh, this is the, one of the few that I could really understand. He, he's a very erudite person. We uh, learn from our everyday experience interfacing with the external environment to interpret pain as reflecting the presence of a peripheral damaging stimulus. And indeed, this is critical to its protective function. Central sensitization induced, introduces another dimension, one where the central nervous system can change, distort, or amplify pain, increasing its degree, duration, and spatial extent in a manner that no longer directly reflects the specific qualities of uh, the peripheral noxious stimulus, but rather the particular function state of circuits in the central nervous system. So the central nervous system can amplify up or down the pain, <clears throat> all right? And you saw there were about seven or eight <clears throat> places in the brain that uh, <clears throat> pain is being affected. So this is not one small center in the brain, it's throughout the brain. <clears throat> uh, it's, the fascinating thing is, you know, that the pain center in the brain and the love center in the brain are very close. So, <clears throat> you know, we get hurt when we lose a relationship. There's a reason for that. <clears throat> um, so, one where the central nervous system changes, distorts, or amplifies, and frequently it am amplifies. If you've ever heard of condition called fibromyalgia, that is a condition where <clears throat> uh, the desensitization is present and <clears throat> where amplification of pain is happening. So <clears throat> uh, uh, this is a common phenomenon. Just, just another example, so it's not, not an easy concept for me or for anyone else. So. <clears throat> Um, the, the, uh, Nielsen and Nielsen did this study on <clears throat> 11 people who had whiplash from an accident. <clears throat> and these people had continuing widespread pain several months after their <clears throat> injury. And so, you know, it makes sense for someone to have pain in here after having a whiplash in a car accident, right? That's what we all assume they are. <clears throat> Um, but when it starts going down both arms, you start asking, well, that, that's kind of hard to understand. Coming down here to both legs, now, that's really <clears throat> uh, doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Because the neck injury was up here. <clears throat> How about if uh, the patient comes in to see me, or Dr. Stum, and they say, <clears throat> I was in this... Uh, I was in this wreck uh, six months ago, and I've got terrible pain in my leg right here since that uh, phenomenon, and they <clears throat> have checked my knee. There's nothing wrong with my knee. This is, this is uh, central sensitization, where the brain is amplifying pain in a widespread area. Make any sense? No. <clears throat> And the fact that it doesn't make sense is what makes it so hard for patients to get good care. <clears throat> but <clears throat> um, this is central sensitization. The, the fact that it can be this widespread, that's central sensitization. Now, <clears throat> this is the word, central sensitization is a word that comes from the scientists because it comes from the central nervous system. <clears throat> I prefer the word hypersensitization because that's what speaks to the patient. They feel the hypersensitization. So these folks, you know, come in the office, <clears throat> they've seen five doctors and have had 100 tests, and, <clears throat> and um, I start to try to explain this when I say, you know, it feels like, you're, does it feel like it's hypersensitive? Yes. That's the sense most of them will really, and John, the patient we talk about, <clears throat> Um, he had um, uh, a lot of hypersensitivity. Okay, we're going to do something now for just a second. <clears throat> uh, everybody grab a partner <clears throat> and just touch them on the hand. 
it, you can swap touching. <clears throat> okay? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You didn't have to touch that long. <clears throat> <clears throat> but uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, when you touch somebody, just barely touch somebody's skin, did that hurt? <clears throat> For John, he he nearly came off the table when I did that to him. Okay, that's called allodynia, <clears throat> and um, there are two forms of pain hypersensitivity actually, but <clears throat> allodynia is where you just touch somebody's uh, hand and, or any place on a sensitive area in their body, and they come off the table. Now, <clears throat> what do I uh, typically think about when I, <clears throat> 10 years ago, if I saw one of those? The patient is drug seeking, a crybaby, or crazy. Those were the kinds of, <clears throat> kinds of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, denigrating thoughts that we start having when someone complains of something we have no concept of. <clears throat> Does that make sense? <clears throat> the other, uh, so hyper, allodynia is the most common of these. Hyperalgesia is where there's just more pain that lasts longer <clears throat> when uh, you have uh, <clears throat> hypersensitivity. And this is, this is the event that the, happens to you or the pro problem that happens to you from using opioids. Opioids can cause hyperalgesia. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> um, if, if none of you have had uh, one of these uh, things happen to you in your life, please stand up and we'll all clap. <clears throat> So uh, the point that I'm going to make is that uh, these are all areas that um, can be chronic pain. So some people might have irritable bowel syndrome, and they might have an attack once a year. But there are plenty of people that live with it and live, may live with it okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> how common do you think these problems are? <clears throat> and how often... How, Oh, you can't. Oh, you can't see the. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, spinal stenosis, PTSD, trauma, pelvic pain, fibromyalgia, 4.5 percent of all women, irritable bowel syndrome, migraine, back pain. <clears throat> this is back pain is 85 percent of people with back pain have no diagnosis. 85 <clears> percent. <throat> so when the doctor tells you. You have, you have back pain because you have osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis in your back. <clears throat> He's just looking for something, or she's just looking for something to write down on the piece of paper <clears throat> so they can get paid because they, nobody has any idea what's going on in a vast majority of back pains, even though that have had my, um, you know, 30% of people have abnormal MRI scans. But if you go have an MRI scan, you have pain, you immediately jump to the fact that, because it's, again, we don't understand. So we, we all need a story that we can believe in. And so it's <clears throat> hard to accept that your back pain is, uh, has no diagnosis. Tension headache, interstitial cystitis, phantom limb syndrome, peripheral neuropathy, rheumatoid arthritis. These are all chronic pain conditions. Is that helpful for, to you, those? That, can't see well. So it, these are common. Anybody got any idea what percent of uh, patients going into any medical center today to be seen in the outpatient world? How many, what percent of them might have this condition? 90. Very wise woman. But it's not quite that, not quite that. It's, it's about 50 percent, especially if you throw in, most people have a little depression and anxiety that go along with this. So this is, this is not something that <clears throat> is a minor issue, right? And what's very important is that every one of these conditions can be 
ratcheted up can be amplified, to use Dr. Wolf's word, um, <clears throat> the, every one of these can be amplified. So if someone is in the um, ED with a migraine headache, it's because they have hypersensitization, hy um, central sensitization of their migraine headache. But, you know, suddenly it, it gets amplified way more than what they're accustomed to. <clears throat> So these, uh, this, this is a, a slide, and I hope everybody can see this one, uh, <clears throat> from uh, uh, our series of images from Mike Hooten at the Mayo Clinic. He runs a three-week immersion program for people with chronic pain, and he spent a day with us <clears throat> a year ago, and he was kind enough to share these images because they really say, speak volumes about the life of people who have chronic pain. So you have a pain disorder, and after three months, um, <clears throat> six months, it won't go away, it's not easy to understand, you develop chronic pain. Chronic pain leads to depression. <coughs> the depression leads to anxiety, or is accompanied by anxiety. Impaired social functioning, you know, you don't want to go out, you, um, want to stay in, you start to push away your friends, and suddenly <clears throat> your life is really becoming a void. Uh, impaired physical functioning, you can't exercise and move like you thought you could and should. <clears throat> that begins to really impact you. And, and then there's the vicious cycle. So the lives of people with chronic pain, yes? The errors are going both ways. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good question, and <clears throat> um, can we come back to that in a minute? Because <clears throat> you're right on target. Maybe I'll go ahead now. <clears throat> so uh, uh, my sense of this, and, and if you look at it, the brain, <clears throat> is that th there is a, a network in our brains, especially those people who have chronic pain. <clears throat> This is really important. So, <clears throat> um, and I, I have somebody working on an image for exactly what you're asking me, but... <clears throat> um, what was the question, please? Thank you. It, the question is, <clears throat> does the depression come first or does the pain come first? Is that an accurate? <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> and the answer is, it's not uncommon for people to be more sensitive to these kinds of pains. And it's not uncommon for people who have pelvic pain to also have irritable bowel syndrome or back pain, okay? And, <clears throat> and it's, uh, the, these folks are the folks who, after an injury, are more likely to end up with chronic pain. And they also uh, are likely to have anxiety or depression with their pain and they're likely to have insomnia. They're likely to have fatigue. So uh, I call this the network syndrome. Is that helpful to you? <clears throat> so uh, um, some of us are prone to this network that <clears throat> spins out of control like we described here. So that <clears throat> um, the vicious cycle is striking various areas in your brain. Whoop, because I never got to the final thing here. So <clears throat> this is Dr. Hunton's image. Where is all this happening? It's all happening in the brain. It's not happening in the arm that hurts. It's not happening in the neck that hurts. <clears throat> this, is, this is all coming from the brain or the central nervous system. <clears throat> so here's the one that I also wanted you to see. <clears throat> Conditions associated with chronic pain are these. And <clears throat> certainly having chronic pain can lead to all of these conditions. <clears throat> they, they tend to come together. And it's really important. And what I'm going to be showing you now is that <clears throat> you have to treat all of these. So why am I up here, a guy who 
uh, you know, does meditation and <clears throat> um, yoga and works with acupuncturists and things because it's real important to address all of this. That makes sense? <clears throat> so State of the Union for pain management in our country, to, in our world today. <clears throat> we have multiple providers treating multiple individuals' somatic comp complaints. So one complaint here, one complaint there, nobody taking a look at the whole. Polypharmacy, oh my God, is that happening? <clears throat> Dangerous drugs, worsening of symptoms, multiple chemical sensitivities in patients with um, <clears throat> central uh, sensitization. <clears throat> um, reduced functionality from side effects, increased financial burden on patients and institutions. <clears throat> I want to come back to uh, central sensitization. Have, have I done a good enough? It's, this is real hard to, to explain. So if, we want, if you want to stop and ask me, now, what, is, what are you really trying to tell me about this central sensitization stuff? I'm glad, yes. So is that a function of a person's temperament if he gets <coughs> a, a hypersensitive, or is it a malfunction of the brain that makes you hypersensitive? <coughs> so, um, it can happen to anyone. So, <coughs> Do we know what causes it? No. We're learning a lot about the chemistry of it. But, <clears throat> so we don't know what causes irritable bowel syndrome. We don't know what causes migraine headache. We don't know what causes this. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, but we know it's a reality. And 10 years ago, nobody had really ever heard of it. So at least we are making progress. <clears throat> and the, 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 the final, the most important piece of this is to practice compassion for these people that even though you can't understand it. Does that make sense? So we are obligated. If somebody comes in and says they're hurting, well, <clears throat> you know, we have to worry that they might be on opioids. And it, so it's really messy. But <clears throat> staying in the compassion for the patient is our obligation. <clears throat> this, is, this is a true uh, <clears throat> patient brought the, the, the drugs that had been, <clears throat> had been uh, prescribed over six or seven years. <clears throat> <clears throat> so what do we really need? We need to improve, help people improve gen people's general function. Physical function, exercise really helps. It doesn't hurt people with central sensitization. They don't believe that until you help them slowly um, start to move again. <clears throat> um, the social, fo social issues, vocational issues, all of those have to be addressed at the same time. <clears throat> and we uh, have to really make an effort to reduce the opioid sedative medications and reduce the $650 billion that's being spent on this <clears throat> in ways that don't help. You know, the people get a number of MRI scans. They get <clears throat> uh, a lot of injections and operations and pills um, that really have limited benefit to them at times. The goal is to optimize medication, optimize rather than uh, flood people with it, medication. <clears throat> it does not work in central sensitization syndromes, quick fixes, that's not possible. It's a condition that demands uh, treating over time. And, <clears throat> again, and just as I said before, a somatic and emotional pathways in the central nervous system cannot be separated in theory or reality. This is back to your question. <clears throat> uh, we, we can't separate those things. So it, it's, <clears throat> we have a, uh, I, I'm, as an internal medicine doctor, um, <clears throat> I am, one of the people who treats the most uh, psychiatric disorders. So, you know, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, those kinds of things. I can't bill a diagnosis for depression. I have to bill fatigue because <clears throat> psychiatrists are over here, all other doctors and medical people are over here, and <clears throat> uh, so the system 
has had this separated forever. Does that make sense? So <clears throat> the truth is there's no separation. <clears throat> so uh, how are we doing for time? Anybody? Okay, well, we've got plenty of time to talk then. So <clears throat> here's a toolbox that we use um, for <clears throat> toolbox that we use for treating these people. <clears throat> and so uh, all of this on the screen can be helpful. But the, the biggest uh, uh, is the neuroplasticity. The brain can be changed. The central nervous system can be changed. And that's what we predicate all of our planning for treatment in. Okay? So this is the third time in this slideshow that <clears throat> we have talked about the fact that neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity exists. And if you've heard Dr. Norton talk about this, I'm sure she has waxed eloquently about neuroplasticity. <clears throat> All the uh, mindfulness is something that Linda talked about, uh, what, two weeks ago? <clears throat> and uh, Linda Manning, we do a lot of mindfulness work for our patients with pain. Massage, uh, acupuncture, <coughs> phantom limb work, <clears throat> positive psychology, breath work. All of these things are things that we can use to change the brain. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is uh, uh, a list of the people that work at the Vanderbilt Center for Integrative Health, where we treat <clears throat> uh, pain all day, every day. We have <clears throat> uh, a nurse practitioner who's a massage therapist. Let's see. We'll Uh-oh, what happened here? How did that happen? <laughs> Computers and I, and I are not. So, uh, <clears throat> um, so our nurse prac one of our nurse practitioners is a <clears throat> massage therapist. One of them is a psychiatric nurse practitioner. One of our nurse practitioners is the health coach leader in, for the entire medical center. <clears throat> and we have a nurse practitioner who specializes in diabetes. Diabetes patients have a lot of these conditions we've been talking about. We have yoga instructors that <clears throat> work on mind-body connection so that <clears throat> um, they can be working in concert with the physical therapist. So it's not uncommon for our yoga teachers and our physical therapists to be in a room together caring for patients. <clears throat> um, the same thing is true about uh, our psychologists, psychology friends. Uh, we have, we're just getting our fifth psychologist there. They, uh, <clears throat> uh, one of our psychologists is the mindfulness director, Linda, who was here a few weeks ago, uh, and we have a pain psychologist who is trained in managing pain patients. <clears throat> Massage therapist, nutrition coach. Nutrition is really important. Uh, so many patients with chronic pain gain a lot of weight. We give them medications that make them gain weight. They're sedentary. They um, have struggles. So <clears throat> um, then we have a research scientist who uh, is, was trained in research at, um, at, who was trained in research at Harvard, who does research on yoga for people with dialysis. <clears throat> um, I'm the lone other physician. We have an acupuncturist who actually is an NIH-funded neuropharmacologist and <clears throat> uh, the uh, physical therapist. We have three physical therapists. Or we have wonderful staff and the patient is a big part of the team. So it's not, you know, take a pill and come back in six months. That They are <clears throat> participating in all of this. <clears throat> yes? Can you say a little more about the actual technique of the neuroplasticity? Of the <clears throat> I, I mean, if I came into you and I had chronic mm -hmm. pain, <clears throat> No, that's a very good question. No, that's a very, very, very good, very good. Thank you for helping me with that. 
<clears throat> um, so um, mindfulness is a uh, program, and I don't know how many of you got to see Linda, but <clears throat> she, what she uh, uh, was teaching you then was how to pay attention in the pro present moment. So and all these things are a part of the neuroplasticity treatment? Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> and, and the mind ch changes the brain, and the body changes the brain. Yes. How successful is the acupuncture with the concept of pain? Acupun um, pain and anxiety are the two things that um, um, acupuncture has been repeatedly shown to be very helpful. And it, it's helped me a lot. So uh, uh, it, it's, it's something that when we started seven years ago, uh, I uh, knew what I'd read, but I've seen so many patients get a lot of benefit from it especially people who are having anxiety and especially people who uh, have pain. Mm -hmm. Regarding plant-based diet, so it's saying not even salmon, not even fish. Does, Does that say plant-based? No, the previous slide. I believe the previous slide. It said plant-based diet. Oh, oh, you talk the, the this one? Yeah, <laughs> plant-based diet is, is uh, yeah, that, that is... Uh, the thing that's been proclaimed, which is clearly the most important part of eating well, is to get at least five and preferably up to nine fruits and vegetables a day, right? So and, um, any, any uh, diet that's not based on the fact that uh, plant-based eating is best is uh, really not working a good diet. <clears throat> No, no, you, you, so plant-based plant doesn't mean, I'm sorry. So I'm not suggesting that you have to leave everything else out, but you have plenty of plant-based foods in your diet. Yeah, up to between five to nine. So some people are vegetarian, some people eat fish. Um, nobody can prove that it really makes you worse than and I don't want to get in any fight with anybody about nutrition here. I, I have to do that every day with my colleagues at work. <laughs> they don't like my sandwich that has meat on it. <laughs> so, but does that, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. But the, the fact that the staff and the patient are listed here, especially the patient, is really, really important. Because if you're going to get better, if you're going to use your brain, the neuroplasticity in your brain to make change, you've got to participate in the process, right? So we, we help people learn this back to your question about <clears throat> how this works. Um, uh, you have to uh, work every day at being in the present moment or doing your yoga class uh, or doing your yoga at home. <clears throat> um, working with the physical therapist, but working the exercises the physical therapist gives you um, when you're at home. So we're all in this together. Health coaching is <clears throat> the uh, uh, primary uh, way that we teach ourselves and others how to help patients. We, uh, <clears throat> health coaches, um, don't tell people what, they, what to do. They ask, begin to ask them, okay, what would you like to change? I would like to change the way I eat. <clears throat> um, how do you propose doing that? Do you hear the open-ended questions? So asking open-ended questions that usually end up in trying to help someone think about what's really meaningful in their life. So uh, I would guess there are people in this room that are like me that... <clears throat> um, what matters the most to me in many ways is family, and I really look forward to trying to see my grandchildren graduate from college. That really matters to me. So <clears throat> if somebody says, well, why in the world are you eating those cheeseburgers again? <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, because I, and well, I don't know, and then 
um, are you interested in seeing your grandchildren graduate from college? Now, you push, push my meaning button. So life, meaning, and purpose, entering the life, meaning, and purpose of people is the best way to help them to begin to stick with whatever neuroplasticity, change, brain-changing process you're you know, trying to help them with. Is that a, a, a way to begin to answer your question? <clears throat> yeah. So if a person comes in presenting, mm -hmm. say, chronic pain, yeah. how do you, um, what happens to them? How do they... Yeah, so um, <laughs> we, we, we don't... Uh, Oh yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, I was I was going to get to that, but I'm glad you asked it. <clears throat> so ah, thank you, thank you. I have hearing issues, so I appreciate that. Yeah. So the question is, how what happens to the patient? How do they get into this? So you can come to our center, which is at 3401 West End. <clears throat> um, uh, and just walk in the door and make a, an appointment to see me or an acupuncturist or anyone else. M most of our, uh, most of the patients that come to see us are referred to us by doctors in Vanderbilt, okay? Especially the chronic, the, the pain center. The pain center at uh, 100 Oaks, it's, <clears throat> they do interventional work. So they do um, uh, procedures to people and help them get appropriate medications. But we have a, a very strong partnership with them. And the patients that they aren't able to help with <clears throat> uh, what they do, they send to us. So that, that's a big referral source for us. But we also have people coming in the door who have not had a referral. Most of the time they've been and a referral. referral. As I've said, you can walk in the door and say, I want acupuncture. But most of the time, what patients do is come to see me or one of the nurse practitioners, and <clears throat> um, we help them develop a plan. Because, <clears throat> as, as th we've already said, um, you, don't get, you can't get well from this overnight. You know, every now and then we get lucky and we give them the magic bullet and magic pill and aha, but most of the time, it's like having diabetes. You have to work a program every day if you have chronic pain. <clears throat> it, and and uh, so getting these disciplines um, over time becomes really important to uh, how you make change. Is that helpful? Did, did, did I answer your question? <clears throat> Yes. Could you tell me what yoga does for you? What it does for you? <clears throat> <clears throat> so yoga <clears throat> is uh, something that is a mind-body practice. <clears throat> um, it does change your brain, <clears throat> uh, and it uh, can enhance your sense of well-being. It also th then, <clears throat> and that's that's uh, um, sort of for all people with yoga. As I suggested, our uh, uh, physician medical director, you know, the, the research scientist up there, he, he is a world-class teacher of therapeutic yoga, yoga that is for people with medical conditions. So he was trained in that and, you know, trained in doing the research at Harvard. And <clears throat> so there's a lot of evidence now that appropriate uh, treatment uh, can be given to people with yoga. I can keep going if you need more. <clears throat> Are these individual sessions? You can have either their individual sessions and their group sessions. The, everybody always wants to know about the cost, and I always forget to say this. So, <clears throat> um, the uh, physical therapy, uh, my services, those of us, the, the medical team, and the psych team. That's all paid for out of, out of uh, insurance, okay? So we very intentionally built this so that somebody could have a mind, body, spirit experience uh, with their insurance. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> so.
So, so uh, <clears throat> uh, but acupuncture in this state is uh, not reimbursed by third party. Third party doesn't reimburse massage or yoga. <clears throat> yes? What, what kind of brain changes are produced by yoga? <clears throat> That's a very good question. And <clears throat> um, that, all of that is being studied very aggressively now, especially in the world of mindfulness, <clears throat> uh, which is a sort of yoga is, uh, as my friend tells me, it, yoga is <clears throat> a way into meditation. And, <clears throat> um, but uh, they, they, they now can use functional MRI scans to see which parts of the brain are being changed. And I can't tell you the name of those par brain parts right now. I can tell you, I, I can tell you more about mindfulness if you have it. The insula of the brain, for instance, is, turns out is a real important area of the brain to study in the realm of mindfulness. Uh, and the insula has been one of the more challenging areas of the brain for functional MRI scans to study. Now they're getting much better at it. <clears throat> is that helpful? <clears throat> yes. Uh, is your clinic, are the clinicians <clears throat> at your clinic at all applying the, uh, the pain theories, the back pain theories of John Sarno, the doctor at NYU, who, who says that back pain is basically emotionally caused, <clears throat> your brain is trying to check trick you by making, giving you a pain so you don't think about your emotional problems? <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> uh, that... <clears throat> I appreciate. I don't know that particular physician, but um, but I do know that for um, all those little circles that you couldn't see, <clears throat> uh, all those little circles you couldn't see, every one of those is what's called a somatic illness. I don't like the name. I like the name. They're mind-body conditions because the mind and the body together then <clears throat> um, cause symptoms. And <clears throat> so it's not just back pain that that is the case for, it's also the case for migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, on and on. Pe people who have uh, what I <clears throat> uh, call the network. Yeah, yes. Yes. I think what you might be asking me, can you still change your brain when you're our age? <laughs> and the answer is, you know, Frank and I <clears throat> have a friend named Bill Petrie who assures me the case is yes. <clears throat> yes. How is John? <clears throat> Thank you for asking. John would appreciate that a lot. <clears throat> um, John is, he, he is... <clears throat> still doing much better, but he has to work a program every day. And he, he is an unusual patient. He does about 200 crunches every day. <clears throat> and he rides his bike 20 miles at a time. So uh, <clears throat> that, that helps him. Yes? How much pushback do you get from the pharmaceutical companies? They haven't, they haven't found us yet. <clears throat> The day, the day we get found, the, 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 I, I, will, I will fear for my life. <clears throat> <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm going to just finish. Um, <clears throat> this is the last uh, slide. <clears throat> this is talking about our three-week immersion program. So the people that go through our program... Uh, and after three to six months, the, after they're not really making progress like we hope, we <clears throat> uh, try to get them into a three-week immersion if they have the resources. So the uh, Mayo Clinic has one, um, Stanford has one, uh, Cleveland Clinic has one. We are in the process of building one of these so that for those people who are not doing well with the uh, program I just showed you, it's the same thing, but it's just a deep immersion for three weeks 
Um, <clears throat> you spend five days per week at the center uh, doing uh, up to se at seven hours a day working on these uh, programs that we've already alluded to. So I, I wanted you to know that, <clears throat> that if you hear about this, it's, it's, uh, you were some of the first to know some of the, about that. Anything else? Thank you very much. <clears throat>